I'd like to welcome you. And today we have a very, very special guest who came from the um, Cleveland Clinic. Uh, so we, we're delighted to have Connie here with us and with more formal introduction, let's go to our student. Alrighty. So good morning, everybody. My name is Carl Laboro. I am a third year graduate student in Dr. Eric Perlman's lab here at UC Irvine. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing our distinguished guest speaker, Dr. Connie Tam, here at the seminar series for the UC Irvine Center for Translational Vision Research and co-sponsored by the Institute for Immunology. So Dr. Tam received her PhD at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, where she studied the pathogenesis of human-specific typhoidal salmonella. She then proceeded to a postdoc position at the UC Berkeley in Dr. Suzanne Fleischick's lab, who is a professor of optometry and vision science. There, Dr. Tam began her studies on Pseudomonas aeruginosa and corneal infections. Dr. Tam stayed on as an assistant research scientist for another five years until her 2012 breakthrough paper in the Journal of Clinical Investigations, where she first published on cytokeratins, a novel family of antimicrobial peptides. From there, Dr. Tam started her own lab in 2014 as an assistant professor of ophthalmology at the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine, where, under a handful of successful R01s, she continued publishing on the cytokeratins and their structure, regulation, and antimicrobial mechanisms. Dr. Tam's discovery of cytokeratins has given way to a new field of research with a focus on corneal epithelial cells as a source of these cytokeratins. Today, Dr. Tam will be discussing with us how to harness keratin to treat ocular inflammation. So Dr. Tam, thank you for taking the time to attend and speak at this event. You may take it away. Thank you, everyone. Uh, this very kind introduction and also uh, reminding me how long the journey has been so far. Um, so today I'm going to talk in, uh, I'm, I'm going to be talking about harnessing keratin to treat ocular inflammation. And this story is about keratin, of course, and um, it really started 10 years ago when I was working as a postdoc in UC Berkeley with um, Dr. Susie Fleissig. So together we discovered um, these keratin fragments that are antimicrobial. And from then um, I started a um, research program to continue exploring uh, what's going on and any new stuff you know, associated with it. Um, so today I'm honored to be here um, to share with you this journey and uh, I hope you find it interesting as well. Um, let's see. So as you all know, um, inflammation is playing a part, a role um, in a lot of um, pathological diseases, um, the development, the progression of these diseases. Um, there are um, non-infectious inflammations and infectious inflammation. And for the non-infectious one, particularly in the eye, uh, that it is pretty well researched that you know um, such um, diseases such as uh, ocular surface inflammation, dry eye diseases, um, is non-infectious, but there is a, a very significant role of inflammation playing in it. Um, and I have uh, encountered some recent publications uh, about uh, toll eye receptors involvement uh, in the back of the eye. Uh, like the um, uh, development of um, uh, CMB lesions, um, as well as these uh, oxidative stress induced um, complement um, mediated retinal degeneration. So um, when I am working on these keratins, I am also thinking about, you know, uh, not only in the infection side, but can we explore something beyond the infection um, to see uh, non-infectious diseases as well. But today I'm still focusing on infection uh, information um, here um, because um, we have been using an infection, a corneal infection model. Um, so, and I want to uh, bring out a couple of um, challenges that we are facing um, when we tackle infectious information um, because um, 
we have to remember that, you know, when we uh, treat infection, uh, infectious information, we have to control both the infection and the information at the same time. We cannot ignore either part. So they are actually two things we have to deal with when we treat this disease. And the first challenge everybody knows about is the antibiotic resistance um, because it is actually uh, um, very concerning um, because um, the pipeline for producing new antibiotics is very insufficient. Um, over the past five years, 10 out of 12 new antibiotics get approved uh, from the, uh, the, the traditional classes of antibiotics where bacteria, some bacteria already established resistance mechanisms against. So we have to realize that we need new antibiotics that are not from the traditional classes, not a, not a spin off, but actually something new to tackle bacteria before they develop resistance mechanisms. Then in the United States, um, we have a surveillance study um, to monitor um, the, the progression of uh, antibiotic resistance, particularly in the eye field, this study, uh, work study. And uh, in the past 10 years, it's been uh, showing that the uh, multi-drug resistant um, staph aureus is getting more and more prevalent. Um, this is concerning because again, you know, we are running out of effective antibiotics. So if some patients come to the clinic and unfortunately got, you know, antibiotic resistant bacteria, that is impossible to treat the infection as early as possible because it inevitably delayed, you know, the treatment um, course. Uh, I, and here, this is just an example of the recent out, outbreak of the extensively drug resistance to the monos aeruginosa. Um, it is so recent, it is just March 21st updated. And um, 68 patients have been infected by this super nasty Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And three people have died, and we have eight reports of vision loss. There's no effective antibiotics to deal with this nasty bug. So this is reminding us we have to prepare for the worst before he actually comes. And besides the infection, like I said, you know, we have to deal with the inflammation as well and to tackle it as early as possible because once the infection develops in the eye, if it has already damaged the tissue, any anti-inflammatory adding afterwards is not going to reverse the damage, right? So, um, however, as you know, we have very limited therapeutic options to suppress inflammation. And the most common used anti-inflammatory is of course steroid. And it's not suitable for everyone. Some people just cannot use, cannot be um, prescribed with steroids because they have other issues going on. And for the infection one, we have to worry about whether the steroid we will negatively affect the clearance of bacteria, would negatively affect the wound healing of the eye. So there are so many concerns that we have to uh, think about before steroids can be prescribed. And so this, again, inevitably delay the treatment of the inflammation as well. So together, you can imagine that the treatment outcome will be poor. So today, I'm going to talk about this keratin-derived antimicrobial peptides that um, we discover not only antibacterial, but anti-inflammatory as well. So before I get into it, um, this um, one-two punch so-called uh, therapeutics, I want to um, just introduce you to what keratins are. So um, keratins, what well, I'm talking about keratins, not the hair keratin, but the epithelial cell intermediate filament keratins. Um, it is highly uh, conserved across mammals. And there are so many types of keratins. There are like um, 54 functional genes in mammals. Um, just for the epithelial cell keratins, there are 13 type one and 15 type two. And type one and type two keratins, they form heterodimers. So 
It has to be this way. They form heterodimers and then they polymerize to form these filaments, as you see here. This is the K6 filaments we stained in the lab in quantum <coughs> cells. And they share common structure. Um, and what do uh, we find in different cells is uh, dependent on the cell types. Um, for example, for simple epithelial cells, um, you could predominantly find uh, K8 and K18, um, such as in the liver, intestine, in the RPE cells. And then for the stratified epithelial cells, such as the corneal epithelium here, you can predominantly find K5, K14, K6, K16, or K6, K17, these pairs. Um, besides cornea, you can see stratified epithelial cells and skin or mucosa, esophagus, and reproductive tract. So it's pretty well um, conserved among different tissues. And the expression level is dependent on the tissue types, as I mentioned, and also the, the differentiation stage, the context, and whether the cells are healthy or not healthy, like cancerous or non-cancerous cells. And the most interesting part I want to bring up is that um, keratin can be postulationally uh, modified. And this postulational modification has a very important role in regulating equilibrium of the assembly and disassembly of the filaments. So the filaments are not just formed, they continuously disassemble and then form again, disassemble and form again. So this is a, 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 a pool of cytosolic keratin. That can do a lot of things, such as interacting with different molecules, pathway molecules in the cells to regulate a lot of uh, physiological events, such as um, the cell survival, cell death, um, cell motility, cell growth, and in general tissue homeostasis, and even like uh, actually the inflammation we are studying right now. So I want to take this opportunity to let you know that we have a couple of posters at Arbo um, that we are looking at the internal endogenous interaction of K6A with um, other pathway molecules to regulate inflammation. Uh, so today I'm not going to talk about this. I'm just leave it back, um, but focus back on to the uh, keratin peptides. <clears throat> so now keratin peptides. Um, the keratin peptides we are studying is derived from keratin 6A. Like I said, there are so many different keratins. One of the keratin is keratin 6A. And this is the full length keratin 6A protein. And the peptides come from the C terminal of this protein. And these are the sequences of it. As you can see, there are a lot of glycine in there. So this is the, when, the first time when I saw this in the mass spec results, uh, just got caught by all these glycine residues. You know, I was thinking when there are so many amino acids repetitions in something, maybe there is a reason, right? So, so that's how I started, you know, it's just all intuition and a little bit of luck, you know. So um, the, the, the red ones that I highlight uh, underlined here is what we call the CAM10 because it's only 10 amino acid longs. And cam 18 c is this one with a few in front and few at the back, four and four. So these two are the two peptides I'm going to focus on for the rest of my talk. Um, we use NMR to solve the structure before doing anything else. We want to characterize it first. So you can see this is the structure of the peptide. It means there's not much structure, <laughs> basically. Um, that's because there are so many guys in residues and there is, uh, there is no rigid structure like the well-known L37. That is, of course, like a helix and the defensins with a lot of beta sheets. These are very rigid structures and the activities of the antimicrobial activities of these peptides are very much dependent on these structures. So you would say, well, without structure then can it do something, you know? And it is actually quite surprising, you know? It actually kills bacteria even without its structure, maybe because it is so flexible. So it can do a lot of different things, you know? 
So let me show you just a few figures of uh, the Q box. So here is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Uh, when you have no peptides, just normal box under the TEM and the uh, SEM, you can see they look like this. But after the chem 10 is added, you can see that the box are pretty much destroyed at the cell membrane level. What about uh, gram positive step aureus? No peptide and with peptide. So the pictures speak for themselves. You can see damages have been done. And these damages are lethal. They kill the bugs. Um, so besides looking at the uh, physical damage of the bacteria, we also looked at whether um, the peptides can interact with any bacterial factors because um, uh, antimicrobial peptides are generally working with different mechanisms, multiple mechanisms at the same time, which gives it an advantage of killing the bugs without the bugs having the chance to develop resistance, um, like multi-weapons, you know. So when we look at this uh, mass spec result, it is uh, IP, even the precipitation of chem with any of these uh, bacterial factors in the cell membrane or in the cytoplasm. We found that there are some co-precipitated with the chem and the two I want to focus on or we feel like it is particularly interesting would be these two, the NQRA and the SLYB of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, because these two proteins are the membrane proteins that chems can recognize. And what is special about them is that they are associated with pathogenic bacteria. These are highly expressed, NQRA is highly expressed in virulent bacteria. The SLYB is upregulated by the FOP, FOQ um, regulatory system. So um, we are thinking, we are going to explore whether CAMs have a preference for pathogenic bacteria, if they can recognize these signatures on pathogenic bacteria. So now, we have known a bit about keratins and the CAMs, and I would like to move on to talk about um, how the epithelial cells produce CAMs before we, can, we want to, before we move on to the new function of it. So here is epithelial cells, and you know that there are toll line receptors on the surface, right? So when the toll line receptors recognize bacterial ligands, does it have any effect on the keratin assembly, disassembly, equilibrium? So let's take a look at these figures. Um, we have control cells that are untreated, and we have three corneal epithelial cells that are treated with uh, flagellin, LPS, or LTA. And what we see is that when cells are treated with these bacterial ligands, FLYC is a toll line receptor 5 ligand, LPS is the uh, toll 4 ligand, LTA is the toll 2 ligand. When they are treated by these ligands, we notice that the filament structure is much more di diffused, you know, suggesting that the disassembly of the filaments is favored. And we, all, we not only see this in the corneal epithelial cells, we also check other epithelial cell types as well. We also observe the same thing. I just didn't put it on, put, put a figure on here. And is it toll-line uh, toll receptor dependent? So the corneal epithelial cells has um, this special thing about it is um, the eyes don't want to have information all the time, right? So it doesn't have much MD2 expressed that Eric has already studied, um, that we need to pump up the MD2, which is the co-receptor of TOL4, in order for the receptor to recognize LPS. So we use interferon gamma, as Eric already published, to upregulate MD2, uh, such that the TOL4 MD2 is a functional receptor. Um, without the interferon gamma, when the TOL4 complex is not functional, we don't see these 
deep polymerization. We only see it when interfering gamma is pre-treating the cells. So suggesting that this uh, toll blood receptor at least toll four receptor is involved in this deep polymerization of the K6A filaments. So now the cells have deep polymerized K6A. We have a bunch of, theoretically speaking, we have a bunch of cytosolic K6A floating around in the cytosol. So next we check is that whether that would increase the amount of chaos produced. Now we have more substrate. Do we get more products? So again, we have pointed epithelial cells treated with fly C, uh, interfering gamma LPS and LTA. We noticed that not only the cytosolic K6A is increased, but also the CAMs, the amount of CAMs is increased. And very interestingly, we don't see any increase in K6A mRNA. So suggesting to us that when epithelial cells are in seeing these ligands, toll-like receptor ligands, they can pump up CAMs production without even need to high express K6A in the first place, which takes a lot longer, you know, when you express the gene and then translate to protein and then degradation. So it is a very quick response for the epithelial cells to just depolymerize from the filaments and the substrate already there in the cytosol for downstream processing to make the product. So then we look at it um, to see whether uh, Phosphorylation is, is actually enhancing this depolarization after toll-like receptor signaling. As I mentioned before, post-translational modification would um, affect the assembly and disassembly equilibria. So the thing we look at here is we use a uh, phosphatase inhibitor to keep the phosphate on the K6A. And we notice that the cytosolic K6A amount is increased. And this cytosolic K6A is, of course, serine phosphorylated. So it's telling us that serine phosphorylation of K6A promote the depolymerization of K6A filament after toll receptor sensing of the bacterial ligands. And we went on to use mass spec to check which serine residues are involved. And we found four serine residues, serine 22, 19, 36, 37, and 60. And we did an experiment to check whether these serine residues are actually involved in the depolarization of K6A filament. So we do this uh, mutation and then uh, we transfect the cells with the expression plasma. So the cells would make mutated K6A and then we check the amount of cytosolic K6A. So we noticed that when you have no, the, all the serine uh, mutated, the four serines are mutated to alanine, we have very little soluble K6A. So that tells us that serine phosphorylation of these four residues, of course, are helping the K6A filament to depolymerize. And then one after the other mutation, we found that serine 37 is most prominent in terms of helping the filament to depolymerize, followed by 22, 19, and 60. So we confirm the four residues are important and we look at the contribution of each residue. So now after the filament has depolymerized, yes, we have a lot more cytosolic K6A you know, floating around inside the cells. What happened afterwards? that could transform these full-length protein into fragments, right? So we look at whether proteasome is playing a role. So we use epoxomycin, a proteasome inhibitor, to inhibit proteasome. And what we notice that is, of course, we see a lot more polyubiquitin K6A. So the K6A after depolymerized, they are ubiquitinated. And if the uh, proteasome is shut down, we have accumulation of polyubiquitin K6A. And we mass spec this and we found these residues are the site where the uh, ubiquitins happen, ubiquitination happens. And with that, you know, with more poly, uh, poly ubiquitin and K6A that they cannot be degraded, do we get a reduction of camps? 
yes, we found that there is a reduction of CAMs. So this data is suggesting to us that CAMs are produced after this, the filament are depolymerized and then the cytosolic K6A is processed by proteasome to generate CAMs. And when we check whether there's a biological significance, we check um, the corneal epithelial cell lysate, we check the mouse cornea surface, we checked the mouse tears that inoculated, that most eyes were inoculated with bacteria. We saw that if these cells or the tissue or the eyes were treated with this uh, proteasome inhibitor, with the reduction of CAMs, we saw an increase of live bacteria. So this tells us that the, 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 the degradation of uh, cytosolic K6A by proteasome into CAMs definitely have a biological significance whether it's in vitro, ex vivo, or in vivo. So let me summarize it really quick. Um, the part about how cells, epithelial cells produce CAMs. So when the cornea is um, encountering different bacteria, gram positive, gram negative, they have these bacterial ligands and these ligands are sensed by the toll receptors. And this trigger the phosphorylation of K6A filaments. And then we have more K6A in the cytosol that are processed by proteasome and produce the CAMs. And the CAMs can kill bacteria at least by lysing them and perhaps by other mechanisms as well. All right, so the next step we want to look at is um, whether CAMs have other functions. As I mentioned, we are interested in not only dealing with infection, but inflammation as well. So we try to see whether uh, CAMs have any anti-inflammatory activity um, beyond its bactericidal activity, which is independent of this bactericidal activity. So what we did was we have uh, primary neutrophils and macrophages, the peritoneal neutrophils and macrophages isolated from mice. And then we treated these cells with CAMs uh, either before or after the stimulant. And then we tried to detect toll receptor signaling activation and also quantify any secreted cytokines in the culture media. So this is the first in vitro approach. So here you see that using flow cytometry, um, we were trying to detect the activation of NF-kappa B and IRF3, the downstream signaling events of toilet receptor. And we found that uh, when these uh, neutrophils are treated with CAM10 before LPS or after LPS, we saw a suppression of NF-kappa B phosphorylation same as the IRF3, suggesting to us that this uh, CAM10, at least CAM10 we test in this uh, experiment, is suppressing NF-kappa B and IRF3 activation after these uh, neutrophils are exposed to the LPS. And we did another experiment to see whether there is a selectivity over toll-like receptors. And the design is we use PolyIC because PolyIC can be sensed by the toilet receptor three on the cell surface when you add uh, PolyIC in the culture media. Or if you transfer PolyIC into the cytosol, it will be recognized by cytoplasmic receptors. So here you see that uh, PolyIC is added to the culture media. And before we treated the cells with CAM10 or after we treated the cells with CAM10. And we noticed that same as the LPS, there's a suppression of NF-kappa B uh, and IRF3 phosphorylation. However, if the cells are being transfected with poly-IC into the cytosol, there's no suppression. It tells us that um, the CAM10 has a selectivity over toll-like receptors. So as I mentioned, besides checking the uh, pathway activation, we wanted to see whether the secreted cytokine level would be affected. So you, here is the neutral fills at 24 hours after being treated with LPS or LTA. 
And uh, we measure four cytokines and chemokines here, IL-6, TNF-alpha, uh, 6L1, and 6L10. We notice that as expected, LPS will upregulate these pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. Um, but if the cells, uh, the neutrophils are pre-treated with CAM10 or CAM18C or post-treated with these two peptides, we saw a suppression of uh, cytokine secretion and is robust for both LPS and LTA ligands. And this is just neutrophils. We look at macrophages as well. Same observation, suppression of pro-inflammatory cytokine and chemokines whether the cells are pre-treated or post-treated with CAM10 and cam 18 c So after this in vitro approach, we move on to the in vivo approach. So we have mice and we inoculate the eyes with uh, LPS to induce corneal inflammation in vivo. And we measure the corneal cytokines. We saw suppression as well, whether the uh, CAM10 or cam 18 c was added before the stimulants or after the stimulants. And then we check with uh, flow cytometry, the, um, the number of immune cells in the inflamed cornea. We saw a reduction of total leukocytes, CD45 positive leukocytes, as well as neutrophils and macrophages. So the suppression of cytokines associated with the suppression of immune cell infiltration, which is logical. We repeated the experiment with LTA <clears throat> and we got the same observation. So both in vitro and in vivo approaches are telling us the same thing. These CAM10 and cam 18 c are able to suppress pro-inflammatory cytokine expression and in the in vivo setting, uh, immune cell infiltration as well. So what is the mechanism involved? Um, so the first thing we checked was to see whether these CAMs can bind to the toilet receptors. The reason why we look in this direction is that when we uh, look at these uh, binding uh, affinity of CAMs with LPS or LTA, the ligand neutralization way, we didn't see a strong binding affinity between CAMs and LPS and LTA. So the alternative mechanism, instead of ligand neutralization, we look at receptor blocking. So when we use a, a, a server, it's called HPEP dog, um, we put this, this toli receptor 4 with MD2, and this is just soluble MD2. This is toli receptor 2, and this is CD14. We noticed that CAM10 and CAM18C, the predicted binding site is just predicted binding site, is at where the LTA and LPS would bind on to. So this gives us some confidence to move on to check whether the blocking um, mechanism is actually in place or not. And more studies have to do, uh, because I, as I mentioned, this is this predictor structure. We have to do more uh, structural characterization to confirm whether the binding sites are actually there. But just to do uh, the in vitro blocking assay to carry on this investigation, we have, uh, we use latex beads because we don't want to use live cells because live cells, again, would have the toilet receptor internalization. So we just use latex piece and then conjugate with toilet receptor 4 and MD2 on the feed surface. And using these uh, fake cells, um, we incubate it with the peptides and then wash these beads after the incubation and then put in the FITC LPS to see whether uh, these beads will be light up from LSB LPS binding. And as you can see here, when the beads are pre-treated with peptides, they block the subsequent binding of FITC LPS to the PBS washed beads. And is the binding to the MD2 or TO4? So we modified this experiment by putting soluble MD2 in the pre-incubation part. And if soluble MD2 is there in the pre-incubation part, we don't see this 
um, inhibition of PCLPS binding because this soluble MD2 is probably already captured CAMs before they can bind onto the beat surface of uh, the MD2 on the beat surface. So these two experiments suggest to us that um, the CAMs are binding onto the soluble, uh, binding onto the MD2 of the TOL4 MD2 complex. So next we look at these um, TOL2. So these beads would be the total receptor two conjugated beads. And same as the TOL4 conjugated beads approach, we pre-incubated beads with peptide, wash the beads, and then put in the FITCLTA and the CD14, which is, uh, CD14 is facilitating the binding of LTA to the TOL2 receptor. And we noticed that the peptides suppressing the binding of FITCLTA if they, the beads are already pre-incubated with that, suggesting so the blocking of the TOTU by the CAMs. We also look at CD14. So when the peptides are pre-incubated with CD14, before the beads and FITC LTA are added, we notice that there's a suppression of FITC LTA binding. And this suggests to us that these peptides bind to the CD14 in a way that they cannot help the LTA binds to the beads afterwards. Um, and these, you may think whether this suppression is due to the peptides bind to the beads itself, right? We use these peptides, the concentration is 600 fold less than the previous experiment. And we check that with this low concentration of peptides, the peptides cannot block efficiently the tone two on the beat surface. So this tells us that it is more likely that the, beat, the peptides bind to CD14 and inhibit the subsequent activity of CD14 to facilitate binding of LTA to the beads. So the ones you just saw is just blocking acid. What about displacement? What if the ligands already down onto the, the beads, you know, would there be any effect for the peptides to kick out the already banned ligands? So this is the displacement assay. When we pre-incubate the beads with PCLPS or PCLTA and then wash the beads, then put in the peptides, we notice this suppression of signals, the, uh, the binding of the LPS and the LTA. So suggesting that this peptides can not only block the receptors, but actually display the ligands, even if the ligands already bound onto the receptors. Besides receptor blocking or displacement, we also look at um, the CAMS effect on the availability of total receptor on the cell surface. So we have neutrophils and macrophage the mouse peritoneal neutrophils and macrophages. And we all know that once the LPS or LTA, once the, LP, once the LPS is um, incubating with neutrophils <coughs> or macrophages, it will induce the internalization of TOL4. So the reduction of cell surface TOL4 uh, by full cytometry. And we noticed the same thing happened with CAM10 and cam c The reduction of cell surface TOL4, but the increase of internal TOL4 signaling. So these experiments suggest to us that CAM10 and cam c would trigger the internalization of TOL4 in neutral fields and macrophages in a way just like LPS does. And this reduce the availability of TOLA receptor 4 on the cell surface even before the TOLA receptors can encounter the ligands. So that would reduce receptor availability and help with the suppression of downstream signaling. We check TOL2 as well. Um, and in, uh, the stimulant is LTA. We notice that as, as expected, LTA is triggering the internalization of TOL2 from outside to inside, and then same as CAM10 and CAM18C for both neutral fields and natural fields. So now we have uh, 
good confidence about this new function of CAMS that, uh, that can uh, alleviate toll-like receptor mediated information. And these mechanisms are independent of these bactericidal activities. So we want to check with this uh, corneal infection model, whether we, we can have this one-two punch therapeutic working um, to alleviate both in infection and inflammation at the same time. So before doing this um, therapeutic efficacy experiment, we first check whether the safety profile is favorable. So we have um, corneal epithelial cells treated with CAMs, and this is a scramble CAM10 control. Um, this is a positive control of tunnel acid apoptosis. We notice that the CAMs are not inducing apoptosis. The CAMs are also not negatively affecting cell viability with a high concentration even. And we have BAK as a control because BAK is the preservative in a lot of uh, ophthalmic solutions that have uh, no negative effect um, on the ocular surface cells. We check the mouse eyes, we put CAMs on it and we have scramble 10 and the saline control. And again with BAK, that could induce barrier function disruption as a positive control. We notice that CAMs are not causing any disruption of the barrier on the ocular surface. And this one is a wound healing, epithelial wound healing experiment that we have mouse eyes and the central epithelium was removed. And we put in CAMs versus this peptide control or just the vehicle saline, we noticed that CAMs not only did not delay the wound healing as steroid would have, it actually enhanced the healing rate compared to no treatment or the scramble. So we have one less concern about using CAMs in the injured cornea because uh, we don't need to worry about the CAMs delay wound healing. So now we actually test the CAMs in the infection model, and this is a prophylactic inf uh, infection model, means that we pretreated the eyes 30 minutes before we put in the bacteria. And we have L37 as a comparison because L37 37, again, is a very well-known antimicrobial peptide, and we want to put this into a context how things compare. So that's why we include L37 in there, and then the scramble 10 is the control. And again, my mouse eye treated with CAM10 or CAM18C before the monas was added or staph aureus was added. So one day after this infection inoculation, we noticed that CAM10 and CAM18C develop much less severe disease compared to the other controls. So there is a protective effect if we use the CAMs before the infection. And we check the CFU, the bacterial burden in the infected eye. You can see there's a reduction, uh, tenfold, hundredfold. So a lot and two lots reduction of bacterial burdens in the eyes. So CAMs, can actually work in vivo as well. Not only we see that in vitro, we have antibacterial activity, but actually in vivo is controlling the infectious burden in the infected eye. And so with less bugs, we also have less disease. And what about immune cells? This is full cytometry. We check these uh, CD47 positive leukocytes and the macrophages, the blue box, and the neutral fields, the red box. And we quantify them. You can see that much less immune cells in these eyes that were pretreated with CAM10 and cam c So we see a very clear protective effect of CAM10 and cam c against Pseudomonas and Staph aureus infections. So now come to the point that, you know, when you have patients coming into the clinic, it's not prophylactic anymore, it's actually treatment, they're already sick. So we have this therapeutic model 
in which we give the peptides uh, one day after we inoculate bacteria. So the disease is already ongoing. Then that's the time, the time zero. At this point, we put in the peptide. And one day after putting in peptides, we notice this. There's much less disease for the CAM10 and CAM18 C treated mouse dies. For three days, three days of treatment. So you can see that as early as one day after treatment, we already saw a reduction of disease scores compared to those that are non-treated or treated with L37 or the scramble peptide. For the non-treated or SC10 treated mice, the disease actually increased as well. And we have a reduction of disease scores as well as the reduction of infectious load in the infected eyes. One day treatment and three day treatment. Pseudomonas and staph aureus as well. So one last thing we check again is the immune cell infiltration with flow cytometry. As expected, the total leukocytes and neutrophils, I didn't put in the macrophage because running out of space, but um, you can see that CAM10 and CAM18C treated mouse eyes for one day or for three days, we have a reduction of immune cell infiltration, whether it is pseudomonas infection or staph aureus infection. So now let me summarize the key points of these uh, preclinical studies. So number one, CAMs are multifunctional, multi-spectrum toll-like receptor antagonists. So the multifunctional, as I mentioned, it is a bactericidal, is anti-inflammatory, and have some pro-healing effect as well. And multi-spectrum, you can see that is not only uh, effective against one toll-like receptor ligand, it's effective against LPS, LTA, um, and poly-IC. So the TOL2, TOL3, and TOL4. And the mechanism involved are uh, the CAMs bind to the toll-like receptor uh, 2 and the 4 co-receptor MD2, CD14, and block the LPS and LTA binding to these receptors, as well as induce the internalization of these receptors before the activation by LPS and LTA. So together, these mechanisms suppress the nf kappa b and uh, IRF3 activation and the downstream production of cytokines and immune cell infiltration as well. And in terms of the preclinical efficacy study, we see that the prophylactic treatment with CAMS on wounded corneas can uh, prevent severe infection by pseudomonas or by staph aureus. And if we uh, treat the eyes 24 hours of bacterial inoculation when the, when the disease is already ongoing, uh, three days of topical CAMS or 18C, as, as early as one day, we already noticed that there's reduction of infectious load and immune cell infiltration. And the cornea is, uh, looks much better. The disease outcome is much better. And treatment with the CAMS can accelerate corneal epithelial wound closure and the barrier restoration while suppressing inflammation. Again, this is the concern we have steroid and we have now one less concern with CAMS. Okay. And with that, I would like to acknowledge people in my lab. Um, so these uh, uh, very early studies with CAM characterization, NMR uh, structural uh, uh, characterization is done by Judy. And then these um, the biology of uh, biogenesis of CAMs is done by Jonathan. And this preclinical study was done by Yen and Jonathan together, and a lot of help from other members in the lab. And our collaborator, um, Professor Wang, Wangshan Wang in University of Nebraska Medical Center, he helped us with the NMR solution structure. Um, and we also use a lot of resources supported by Kauai Institute and the Learner Research Institute, and as well as the Case Western Reserve University. And we cannot have done this 
quite comprehensive study without the support, generous support from NEI, as well as other funding resources, such as the Epicite, the RPB, and the Cleveland Eye Bank. With that, I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take your questions. All right, let me just very quickly start with uh, one question about toxicology in kind of general terms. Is, did you study systemic toxicology with the toxicity of this peptide? Not yet, not yet. That is something we need to do more about it um, mm -hmm. in order to translate it to clinic someday, right? Um, so this is just, at this point, it's more like a proof of principle give us the confidence to invest more time and resources into further studies. And the other uh, question related to that, would it be worth to make unbiased library of those peptides that you just make all of the potential changes with natural and not natural amino acids uh, to expand it before you kind of focus on developing this as a therapeutic? You mean like a do more engineering, like yes. you know, optimizing yes. the amino acid sequences. Yes, definitely. Uh, as I mentioned, we see that the natural chems can excuse me, interact with um, bacterial factors, SLYB and QRA, interact host receptors, TLR2, TLR, uh, MD2, CD14. All these, we are planning to do structural characterization. Uh, with cryo-EM, with NMR, to understand the actual binding site of it and which amino acid, amino acid residues are responsible for these interactions. And with that information, we can help use to um, modify the sequence in a way that favor maybe stronger binding, uh, more selective binding. Um, so that would help with the efficacy in the long run, yes. Okay, let's go to a uh, web and to the Zoom. Uh, so, Merchant. Yes, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. It was fantastic. And just from a clinical standpoint, I can tell you how important it is because daily we are dealing with these corneal infections, ocular surface infections that have this really profound uh, inflammatory impact. And then that inflammatory impact creates neovascularization and downstream sequelae, which make subsequent transplants and such um, higher risk of failure. So this is so critical to treat both the inflammation and the infection at the same time. And steroids definitely are uh, not the solution because, you know, they because of the side effects and potential for worsening of the infection. My question for you was, have you looked at um, impact on acanth amoeba and fungal uh, infections as well? We, we struggle with those clinically. We have not looked at these two different kinds of pathogens, but um, definitely we can start looking at it as well because uh, we are going to, I'm going to talk with Eric actually this afternoon to learn more about fungal infection and how we can incorporate into his model of fungal infections. And for acanthamoeba, uh, I guess I have to talk to another person, right? <laughs> we have a cantamoeba as well. Oh, okay, you have it too. So that will be something that we'd love to do as well. Thank you. All right, let's move to Marco. Hello, thank you very much for the talk. Thank you. Actually, I wonder if you also consider to expand the utility of your camps to also try to bring other therapeutics to a translational stage. Specifically, I saw that you have data about the inhibition of the response of TLR3 with your camp. And uh, in the srna war, so in the RNA interference, this actually has been blocked in visual research because of the induced TLR3 response. So I wanted to know if you think to do something with this uh, beautiful CAMP10 that you have, then yeah. an avenue of research that you're concerned. Yeah. So yeah, you mentioned CAMP10, and we're really happy that only 10 amino acids came. That's the wonder, <laughs> because <laughs> that actually uh, can save a lot of money in terms of you know manufacturing. And the shorter it is, the less prone to protease inhibition, right? So, um, 
And when we see that, oh, not only TOE2, but TOE4, TOE3 uh, uh, receptors, the signaling is inhibited. We are thinking um, in the real life, you know, um, it's impossible for just one toilet receptor being activated, right, in the patient. If we have multi-spectrum toilet receptor antagonist, then it increased the, the chance of actually suppressing this inflammation than when you have just one toilet receptor for specific antagonist or one particular, you know, uh, one at a time, you know. So I guess um, um, the reason why uh, in the clinical trial, that, that actually there are not that many um, toilet receptor antagonists being tested right now. Most of them are agonists, actually enhancing the inflammation, such as in the uh, vaccine adjuvants or in the cancer therapy. But in terms of antagonists, there are not that many success, maybe because people are just focusing on one toilet receptor at a time in a complex disease when multiple toilet receptors are being activated. So I would imagine, you know, like you say, you know, using a multi-spectrum toilet receptor antagonist would have efficacies um, beyond the infection model we just used, you know. Um, so I actually have planned to look into, um, in terms of infection, I would like to look into endophthalmitis the internal uh, infection of the eye, because right now we are dealing with the cornea. Um, of course, endothomitis, we will not be just using topical, like right now we're using topical mixed with liposomes to enhance the penetration of the peptides into the stroma. But for endothomitis, we probably have to use injection until we find out, you know, to uh, develop a better vehicle. Um, we also want to look at um, ocular surface inflammation with Jamie, um, maybe dry eye diseases, which is heavily dependent on toilet receptor as well. And um, I also want to look into the back of the eye because like I mentioned at the very beginning, I saw a few, two or three recent publications um, demonstrating toilet receptor two. If you inhibit it with antibodies, you can um, suppress the, the, the CND, that uh, choroidal, uh, vascularization lesion growth. Those lesions are induced by laser or hyper um, And also another paper was talking about um, inhibiting toilet receptor 2, um, which promotes toilet receptor 2 activation, promotes complement expression in the retina. And a lot of people, you know, the complement is playing a damaging role um, in terms of retinal degeneration diseases. So I would like to test whether the toilet receptors if I injected into the eye would help suppress the TOL2 activation and therefore uh, reduce the lesion growth, reduce the neovascularization, reduce the generation of the retina as well. Doug? Thank you so much for that really interesting talk. Um, so my question is kind of revolving around the role of these cytokeratins in infection, kind of without the addition of like topical uh, cytokeratins. So are these keratins kind of biologically mainly focused on the resolution, resolution of inflammation, like after macrophages and neutrophils have cleared like the majority of bacterial burden and you're trying to basically like dampen all the all of the <coughs> inflammatory signaling. Mm -hmm. um, and how does that kind of relate to its use as like, you know, basically can you separate out the antimicrobial or like microbial killing activity versus the immunosuppressive activity or are those kind of? Right, so the um, very early on the uh, in vitro assay using um, peritoneal mouse neutrophils and macrophages as well as the sterile corneal inflammation model just using LPS and LTA, those models have no infection going on. So we took out, the, like you said, you know, the antibacterial part, the activity of the peptide, just looking at when there is sterile inflammation, do we get any anti-inflammatory effect? And the answer is, we already see it, is yes. Um, so um, in the future, like I said, you know, um, for sterile inflammation, we like to test the ocular surface inflammation, dry eye diseases, even at the back of the eye, degenerative diseases. Those have no infection going on. 
and we can actually see the anti-inflammatory effect of the efficacy. Do you know when that deep like the depolarization <coughs> occurs? Depolarization, yeah. In, in vivo, like throughout an infection model, basically, like kind right. of controlled. We 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 are not able to. Well, I guess um, there's a technology limitation right now because you know um, we can only use in vitro to observe the depolarization because the cells are flat in front of you to actually see those filaments. But in the tissues, it's already so dense together that we are not able to see the depolarization, but we can only measure the amount of CAMs produced mm -hmm. or the cytosolic uh, K6A amount in the lysine. Mm -hmm. But if you want to visualize depolarization, um, it's not possible at this point to do it in vivo. Or more so just like have a time course mm -hmm. of that in like lysates. Right, example. right, yeah, that's definitely doable. Yes, good idea, yeah. John, oh yeah, thank you for this presentation. I was wondering, uh, do you, what's, what's the range of this, these CAMs for different kinds of pathogens in terms of like if they're mostly you suspect good for like gram positive uh, path, uh, bacteria or they're like based off mechanism potentially more, like what would be the potential range? And sort right, of right. Um, we have tried, um, like this one is the Staph aureus gram positive and the Stomonas, which is gram negative. We have tried other um, E. coli gram negative. We have tried um, uh, Serratia. We have tried um, Strep. Pyogenes, you know, so we have tried a few, but definitely not a really, really wide spectrum of uh, killing essays. Um, that was published in the JCI paper 10 years ago when we first discovered this antimicrobial activity of the keratin fragmentation products. Um, so to translate into clinic, definitely we need to do a lot more thorough, um, they call it MIC studies to see um, what is the MIC for a spectrum of bacteria, including the uh, antibiotic resistance bacteria, which is actually the, something that we need to tackle, not just the regular box, but the antibiotic resistance mm -hmm. box. We need to see the MIC uh, level of the camps against these nasty stuff. Yes. Okay, let's go to Rafael and then to famous professors. Hi, Dr. Tan. Thank you for Hi. this extremely interesting talk. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, so you have these two peptides. One seems to be more effective against Staphylococcus aureus, the other against Pseudomonas ruginosa. Would you envision using cocktail of peptides to address wider range of bacteria or finding like a hybrid peptide or something to have broader specificity? Can you comment on that, please? Yes, yes. So you noticed that. I noticed that too, but the infinite. So yes, I noticed that CAM 18C seems to be a little bit more effective against Staph aureus. CAM 10 is a little bit more effective against Pseudomonas. So it seems like the sequence, you know, even like four amino acid residues before and four amino acid residues after the CAM 10 in the middle makes a difference to the, um, the spectrum or the activities, you know. So um, um, in, in a clinic, it's definitely doable to do mixed peptides, right? And like Chris just mentioned, um, we can also modify the amino acid residues on these camps. Right now, these sequences are natural sequences. So we can definitely use the engineering method to enhance the activity of the peptides against certain bugs, you know? Or, oh, this one is antibiotic resistance. Can we also mix with other antibiotics to do a co-therapy? Um, to enhance the activities. So there are unlimited options basically to further expand this usage, you know, against bugs, against fungi, against the campanilla or antibacterial antibody resistance bugs as well. Yes. Connie, great, great talk. Um, really beautiful story. A uh, couple of questions, one basic, one more translational. Um, in terms of the ability of these peptides to block the antagonistic sense that you're saying, you generally, when you, when you activate these, uh, these toll receptors, you're going to get a signal. 
um, and you showed that they do block and that they seem to interfere and they even displace the, the normal uh, ligands, which is remarkable. But do you, did you measure downstream effects to see if you're actually either measuring the dimerization, did they dimerize because they're all heterodimers or homodimers? Um, or did you uh, look at other signaling mechanisms then? So the end point we looked at was the NF Maybe repeat the question for the audience. Also, <laughs> so your question is, have we looked into the downstream signaling after the blocking or displacement, right? Or the dimerization. Or dimerization of receptors. Yeah. We have not looked at dimerization of receptors. Um, the downstream we looked at was the nf copper b and IRF3 phosphorylation. Um, and then more downstream is, of course, the biological effect is the uh, cytokine production yeah. and immune cell infiltration. But in the middle, uh, no, we have not looked at it yet. Yes. Um, so then the translational part is that you, you show significant reduction in the, uh, in the keratitis models but they're not completely gone. Yeah, it's not completely gone. Is that an issue of this is as good as it gets, or are you going to substitute peptides, mm -hmm. or are you going to find you're using liposomes just now, um, using better delivery systems? Yeah, exactly. So right now, we see a good effect, but it's not good enough yet. Um, the one reason is that we just use generic liposomes to mix with this peptide for the topical applications. And as you know, delivery vehicle is very important for any drugs, you know. So right now we have not yet optimized the delivery vehicle. Number two is like the sequence, you know. Um, is the sequence the best yet? We have room to improve, definitely. So there are many ways we can do to improve the performance. And that's something we need to invest more time and resources to, to dig into it, yes. When you, when you form your company, you can do that. Well, actually, I, I, I submitted a grant looking for good for you. Money. All right. The yes. final comments go to our famous professor. It's all yours. <laughs> Wonderful talk, Tony. So many questions. Uh, but I was wondering from a homeostasis point of view, maybe, maybe I missed this, but uh, you show beautifully how the keratin filaments disappear in the cultures cells. And those were representative mainly of basal or wing cells. But the superficial cells are, are much more uh, cross-linked and then they desquamate. Do the CAMs also come from those uh, desquamated cells? And, and uh, would that also then, if you're thinking of you know, during sleep, there's a, the ocular surface changes quite dramatically. Mm -hmm. The inflammatory cells that are present are, are, are very different in their activity. Do you think they, these camps might play a role in modifying that ocular surface? Yeah, so you mentioned these scenarios. Um, it's very true and practical scenarios that we need to address it with the in vivo models that you can help me with. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Are they dead? Are they dead? Are they dead? <laughs> so talking about they, these... They desquamate and they desquamate into the uh, tear film. And when you sleep, they can also desquamate. Um, and so that desquamation process would release those yeah. camps and then provide yeah. for an, yeah. a better antimicrobial surface and modify, uh, you know, PMMs or macrophages that are in the tear film during sleep, you know, when you wash those out, they're very different than, than the, the inflammatory cells that you see during inflammation. Uh, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, like uh, the keratin expression, like I mentioned, it is uh, differentiation dependent as well, right? So you mentioned the wing cells, you mentioned basal cells, you mentioned the apical cells. Um, so K6 is strongly expressed in the middle, the, um, the uh, super basal, not yet, not the basal basal, but not the apical as well in the middle. K6. So, K6, yeah. So these fragments, the yeah, in the cornea. So I would imagine, you know, it's the middle of the cornea that produce the largest amount of K6. But whether, um, you know, when you're sleeping at apical, like they, the cells died and they released, you know, we need to do the in vivo model to, to actually check or the amount of uh, CAMs in the tears. 
Um, we, we, we have problem using Western blot to detect CAMS in the TSD <coughs> because uh, at that time we didn't have this uh, machine to just use one microliter of tears. We got to pull a lot of stuff into it and propping peptides by Western blot is quite tricky when the peptide is only one kilodalton. Not, you know, that's so, so tiny. Um, we lost a lot of samples while doing Western blot, you know, transferring the gels, uh, rocking the membrane in the buffer. And not, uh, we didn't get really robust detection. But we recently got a machine just use one microliter of samples that the capillary Western blot that we could try playing with it and see we can look at human tears as well when tears are so precious. Now, you know. now that you brought up K6 in the cornea, uh, certainly it's not the major keratin of the cornea uh, by far and away. Um, whereas in the conjunctiva, K6 is the predominant yeah. keratin. Uh, do you think this plays more of a role in, in conjunctival biology than mm. portal biology? It's possible, definitely possible. Yeah. Um, like maybe conjunctiva produce even more. Um, but at the end, yes, they all come to the ocular surface. So um, like we just talked about, you know, we can look at different tissues on the ocular surface besides the cornea. We can look at the conch, we can look at the myobian gland. Um, but this is the start of the journey, yes. Connie, thank you so much. So I don't want to embarrass myself with the question. Could that be for Thank you.